The content herein is for informational purposes only, not intended as medical advice, diagnosis or treatment, and is not to be substituted for direct advice from your doctor. Today's LymphCast program is proudly sponsored by Vita Support MD, the makers of Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000. These MPFF-based nutraceuticals are backed by science and recommended by doctors specializing in venous and lymphatic disorders. Visit VitaSupportMD.com to learn more. Well, greetings and welcome to our LymphCast show, episode 48 tonight. We do want to invite you to visit our website often. Several times a week, there's always new information going on there, and that is lymphcastnetwork.com. This show is available on YouTube and every podcast platform under the sun. Wherever you go, we are there waiting for you. If you have a question for anybody on the panel, you can send it by email to hello at lymphcastnetwork.com. Let's go ahead and meet the panel tonight, the gentleman who had the idea to start this whole show to begin with. He's also the owner and founder uh, Vita Support MD. They make Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000 from New Jersey physician, surgeon, Dr. John A. Chuback. Hello, Dr. Chuback. How are you? Hi, Paul. Doing great. Thanks so much. Looking forward to a terrific program tonight. It will be terrific. Absolutely. We had a little pregame chat and I think we're good to go. The CEO of the Chuback Medical Center. She's also the producer of this show and has been so from the beginning. Dr. Diane Chuback. Hello, Dr. Chuback. How are you? Hello, Paul. Dr. Paul, how are you? So happy to be here today. Uh, wow, we are very excited because we have the famous Amy Rivera with us again. <laughs> and with all that she does and all that she has brought to, to this forum of learning everything about lymphedema, um, she has co-authored a book well, she has co-compiled a book, I should say, technically with Matt Hazeldine, who you've probably seen on the show before, and it is Lymphedema United, You Are Not Alone. And this book is a beautiful compilation of real life stories of people with lymphedema and describing their journey and what they would like others to know about how they've gone through the troubles into the triumph. And so, Amy Rivera, welcome once again to the show. How are you today? Thank you. I'm good. And it's always a pleasure to be on with you guys. And um, so I'm excited to hear the stories because um, working with these two amazing women, um, just brought a lot of feelings and emotions back to myself and my own lymphedema journey. So I am incredibly blessed to be on this panel with you guys and these lovely women and sharing their stories today. Thank you. And thank you so much for bringing them to us. So today I'm going to, uh, we have we have Kirsten and we have another Amy. And we're going to start with, with Kirsten Wall. And Kirsten, you were from the United States. Yeah. And you have written um, a chapter in Amy and Matt's book, I think chapter 33. Uh, yes. yes. And, um, you know, both of you ladies have come to us with stories about bilateral lymphedema and, you know, there's, and I find that there, although very different stories, there's, there's so many different, you know, common threads between them both. And, and so, but anyway, I would, I would like to Kirsten introduce you and have you start, just give us a sense of how this all happened for you and the journey going forward. Well, thank you so much for having me on tonight. I feel honored to be here, but the journey is crazy. And I mean, feel free to stop me at any time because I could talk about this all day long. <laughs> but um, just, I mean, it's a journey in itself and getting diagnosed. I hate hearing all those stories out there and so many patients who have this swelling and um, it just gets put off as one thing or another and getting misdiagnosed and mistreated. So I'm, I, I do feel very lucky. I think I'd mentioned in my story that it did take me uh, up to two dozen doctor's appointments to get diagnosed. But I was 19 years old, uh, very petite, very fit. I mean, I was a D3 college athlete at the time when I was going through this process of getting diagnosed. So, you know, overweight wasn't the issue. I've never had any previous trauma, no surgeries. You could say I was healthy. It's like all the puzzle pieces weren't adding up. And I just got lucky to come across a vein surgeon or vein specialist 
that knew all those boxes and was like looking at all my history and was like, okay, you've had an MRI, you've had a CT, you've had an FN, F, uh, uh, FNA, um, you know, you've had all these things done and everything comes back normal. So I'm diagnosing you with lymphedema. So I just feel very grateful um, that it took me six months and I hate that it takes others, most others so much longer to get diagnosed and treated. Um, but then even the diagnosis, it doesn't even end there. It's just uh, denial. And like, what do you mean I'm gonna have this for the rest of my life? And there's nothing to help it. I'll be put in compression. And so then you take advantage of having, you know, I, I took advantage of having that edge of being diagnosed, quote unquote, so quickly compared to others and wanting to deny it and find second opinions and just be told, well, I don't know what lymphedema is. So the journey has been a crazy one. And I mean, it took five, four going on to the fifth year of uh, getting past that grieving process and finally into acceptance and just realizing I got to make a difference. I, I just have to make a difference. I'm not happy. I'm not happy with who I am. I'm not happy with how I'm treating others. Not that I was like treating them poorly, but just wasn't a great friend. And like, didn't want to do anything. Um, and I was like, I'm better than this. Like, I want to be better than this. And I'm too young to have to like have a miserable life from here on out. So what, what can I do now to make tomorrow better? And that's how I finally started getting better, not just mentally and emotionally, but physically. And I started doing surgeries and the surgeries have helped really decrease the swelling. Now they're not a cure, um, as most know, but I like to say, this is just me saying it, not a medical professional. I like to say they help me hit the reset button. So they help take out all the swelling, fix some things up, do a bypass, do the lymph node transfer. And now with all the 10 years of knowledge I have now, I can apply that all day, every day, instead of uh, six years ago, I had no knowledge at all. And so it was just hard to apply the little you know, the few tools I had, whereas now I just have so many tools and so many things that, you know, every day is different and having it bilateral is extremely different. Um, both my legs react to things differently. So yeah, it does stink. Um, cause Amy B, I, I know I'm sure you, well, we can all, well, both of us can uh, relate to this, but you know, it's double the work, double the finance, the financial burden. I mean, don't even, don't even get me started on insurance. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it's double everything. Um, but it, I, I do find it funny and interesting how with lymphedema, it's different for everybody. And even within myself and my own body, it's different between my two legs. Like in my right leg, my calf is the problem area. And in my right leg, it's my foot and my ankle. Um, my right leg likes a lot more, um, tautness than my left leg does. And it's just funny trying to adapt to those things because then you go and you wrap one leg and then it's like, oh, crap, this is too tight for this leg. So it, it's just it's just a lot of trial and error with this disease, I've kind of felt like, in, in my opinion, and figuring out what works and what doesn't work. Right. And, you know, you when you talked about the early years in this and the stages and you were you're an athlete, you're a college student. I mean, gosh, there's so many so much personal growth going on already and then now you're you're dealing with this kind of thing and and you don't even know what what's happening to yeah. you um so and you know you, you you're very open and you talk a lot about misery and about that kind of hopelessness and and you know uh there's a very powerful imagery that you used about you know the idea that you feel like you're down in a well tell us about that well, I came up with that one day. I just, it was just one of those moments where I felt like I was drowning and I like, I like analogies. I like to compare things and I felt like I was drowning and, and like drowning in my own body, drowning in my own lymph. Like the lymphedema was taking over me, it was taking over my routine, what I do, what I didn't do. And I felt like I was stuck in a well. I had fallen in and I was trapped and it's like people are, you know, I've got support. I've got love, I've got family, I've got friends and absolutely no one who from day one, I'd consider a friend or family, no one has turned their back on me, no matter how depressed and maybe not a nice, uh, very pleasant person I used to be around during the early stages. It wasn't very pleasant, we'll say that. Um, you know, no one turned their back on me. So, you know, they're reaching it and, you know, they're there, they're helping, but the ball's too deep for them to grab my hand. And, and just that misery is like, I don't even want to try. 
Like, it's just, it, it's too depressing. I don't even want to try. My legs hurt. I'm just going to sit here and do nothing. And it just, um, my, my now husband, I really think it was when we started dating when that turnaround came because I was like, I'm being an unpleasant person to such this amazing guy, this amazing human being. Not, not that like the rest of my friends and family weren't amazing and, you know, didn't deserve this miserable person being unpleasant to them. But I, you know, being in lymphedema and being young and on the dating scene, it's a worry. It's a concern. And I'm like, I never thought in a million years I would have a shot with this guy. Like, honestly. And here he is wanting to get to know me, wanting to be with me. I was a little embarrassed about my lymphedema back then. The only thing I was embarrassed about was being in my pump. And so I gradually got over that. And I was just like, I, I need to do something. Something needs to change. And it wasn't overnight. Now, telling myself something needs to change was overnight, but it, it still took some time to figure out what needs to change. Um, it, it's, you know, it's not like cold turkey. It, it still took some time what needs to be changed. And I needed to be more patient. I needed to do more research. I needed to do more knowledge. And, um, you know, I'm given these one tools, but there's other tools out there. So what are these other things out there that may work for me? And, and having my lymphedema Instagram really helped and, you know, meet both Amy's we have here and meet y'all and just meet other people all around the world. And, and, you know, what do they use? And I'll talk to my occupational therapist about it just to have another professional say, what do you think about this? I saw another lymphedema patient who uses this. And then we would consult about it and like, okay, it feels safe. I'll go try it. You know, a lot of trial and error, but, um, being stuck in that well, it was as soon as I made the decision to do something better to um, make a change is when I could finally feel like I, I could grasp onto my friends and my family's hands and allow them to help me and, and help me pull them out. So I, I don't feel like I'm drowning anymore. I may be drowning in stress just for adult life and life is life, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't feel like my lymphedema is controlling my life anymore. Whereas back then it was, I was for sure well, you could say literally, you know, we've got chronically swollen legs. We're, <laughs> they're literally drowning. But, um, you know, back then I felt like I was drowning and drowning in my own lymph. And and now I feel like, um, you know, I walk to my well and I get the water that I need and I go about my day. So right. um, it's just I, I felt like that that's the best way I found that I can explain of how it all felt for me. Right. And you say that acceptance is key and acceptance is that part, you know, I, when you think about how, when someone has something like this happen in their lives, you know, the primary problem obviously is the chronic illness or in your case, lymphedema. The secondary part is, is the misery, right? And then, well, what do I have a real choice about? So, and the idea is that really you don't have much of a choice about the primary problem, but the secondary problem you do have a choice with. And that's where yeah. what you're describing is that, that acceptance. And then now I can make a choice that I'm going to live with this. And, and Amy, you're nodding your head. Tell us what you're thinking. Which Amy? <laughs> Amy <laughs> Farah. <laughs> okay. Like anyone interrupts. You know, there's quite a few things that Kirsten said that I completely understand. The well analogy is a wonderful analogy because I think all of us as lymphedema thrivers, we um, <clears throat> we feel like we're drowning in all these areas of our lives when it comes to lymphedema. And so when I was misdiagnosed for over 30 years and the doors kept slamming in my face, I just had this thought this mindset that you're not going to tell me how to live and how I'm going to feel. I'm going to tell myself. And, and a lot of people ask me, it's, or they say to me, it's easy for you to say, change your mindset. It's easy for you to, to be accepting of yourself. But what they don't understand is I started where they are. I started where Kirsten was. I started where Amy Beef was. And it truly is the key to set yourself free is the mindset shift. And no matter what, God willing, tomorrow comes, let let it come with a fresh mind, a fresh view and, you know, self-love in that sense. And and I know, like she said, it's not going to be overnight, but it, it does take time. But the more you work on it, the easier it does become. And then 
you do learn to live with lymphedema than simply survive. So my hat's off to you with that because that is something that we all struggle with in the community. And some of us are further along in our journeys than others. And so it's really important for us to talk about this and normalize how we feel, normalize the misery and understand it's natural and normal, but not stay in it. Let's, let's work through it. And I think that's where the healing process starts as Kirsten said. And the other thing I wanted to say was, you know, um, you really, uh, you touched a point that we, we often talk about dating with lymphedema. And so many people ask me, how did you date with your leg being so large? And, you know, the, the funny thing that struck me was you were insecure in your pump. I was just insecure showing my leg. <laughs> so, you know, I just, I love that you shared that insecurity because that may resonate with someone else. And they'd be like, oh, so I, I'm not the only one. So thank you for sharing that. And I totally 100% agree with you. Uh, mindset and self-acceptance is the key to thriving. Well, yeah. thank you. Yeah, that's amazing. And so, you know, I wanted to then, I guess what we could do now is we can introduce Amy B. Now, please pronounce your last name for me. <laughs> sure. Here. It sounds like teeth, but it starts with a B. So B. Amy B. Yeah. All right. Amy, welcome. And you're joining us from Canada. Yeah, I'm up in Edmonton, Alberta. Yes. All right. Awesome. Um, I, so, can I interrupt a minute? Of course. Before yes. you move on. I know I know this is this is your show, but I want to I want to just no, by all means. Words, just get a couple of words in because I think that was such a fascinating discussion. Um, there are a few things that I want to just throw in throw in the in the ring there for for greater discussion amongst all of us and as we go forward also with Amy B's story. I've been I've been talking about this on Lymphcast for a long time as a as a surgeon and as a person who was trained to sort of fix things mechanically. That's one of the things that surgeons are so attracted to in medicine is that most of the things that we get involved in are are fixable, whether I was doing a triple bypass or a valve repair or now closing a, a, a refluxing saphenous vein with a laser. There's a great there's a great sense of achievement and accomplishment um, with this mechanical part of the human body or parts, whether you're an orthopedic surgeon replacing a hip or a knee or fixing a broken bone, etc. But one of the things that I've really, really resonated with in my growth as a physician taking care of people with lymphedema and lipedema for that matter, is that there's an enormous psychosocial and emotional part to this disease, which is why this why this podcast and this special series especially is so important. And there were a few things that were discussed here um, that Kirsten talked about. And and I think it's important that we go over this again and again for our listeners and for our physician listeners, patient mm -hmm. listeners, physician listeners, family members, just interested parties, that um, this, this idea that each of us can take responsibility for how we feel about things. And this is for people without lymphedema, too. This is for all of us, you know, whatever problems we have in our lives. And I keep next to my desk, the people who are watching on Instagram. I have many pictures of all my my heroes next to my desk, but this is Dr. Viktor Frankl. And Dr. Viktor Frankl was a Viennese psychiatrist, a Jewish psychiatrist, who during the Second World War spent years in a concentration camp. Many of his family members were killed. And he made a decision that no one was going to determine how he felt about things, how he felt about his captors, how he felt about his guards, how he felt about himself. And and he fortunately survived and he and he got out and later he lectured and he taught. And his his big thing was the will to meaning, that human beings' greatest desire is really to have meaning in life. And I think it's a very interesting subject because I mean there are there are other psychi psychological, psychiatric mm -hmm. schools of thought. One was the will to sex with Freud, that everything was about sex, one was the will to power with Adler. But then came then came uh, Frankel, who said those things are important, but the most important thing that drives us is is to have some meaning. And I think Amy is a great champion of this, and and so are the other ladies on the show tonight, and all of our guests. 
it's just ironic how frequently we come around to this idea that, you know, Amanda Sobey has been on the show in a certain kind of ironic way, mm-hmm. how this disease brings a lot of people around to finding a different level of meaning in their life. Once once they get to a certain po- you know point with it and almost an appreciation fo- for it because it lets you see the world in a different way and maybe a more meaningful way and and so forth. So I I was just having some of those thoughts when when Kirsten was thinking and the the one other thing that I want to touch on is this idea of her feeling of being in a well. Um there's there's a great old sort of personal development uh, story fable that I, that I love, and I'm going to share that quickly, and then and then we can move on. But it's the idea of this this farmer's uh, mule that falls down a well, a dry well, and gets trapped down in this bottom of this hundred foot well, and it's you know it's obviously a, 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 an animal that means something to him from a practical point of view for running the farm, but he also has an emotional connection, just like that lovely dog there behind Kirsten, that we have emotional connections to, to animals. And he feels really attached to this to this mule and really wants to do everything he can to save its life. And he calls some of his farmer friends and they bring everything they can think of, pulleys and ropes and harnesses and everything else. But they simply can't, you know, pull this mule out from this well, so deep in this well. And ultimately, one of his friend says to him, listen, you know, I hate to say this, but you know, we're never going to get this donkey out of there. It's just impossible. We don't have the equipment to do it. He said, I think the most, the most compassionate thing to do would be if we, if we bury it so that it doesn't starve to death over a long period of time. And they all agree that that would be the kindest thing to do and the quickest and the most compassionate. And they start one shovel at a time, throwing dirt down on the, on the donkey and it lands on his back. And he shakes it off and he stands on top of it and he shakes it off and he stands on top of it. And they keep trying to bury the donkey. And what they do little by little, inch by inch, is they fill the well. And there an hour later, the donkey is standing before them on the ground next to them. And I think it's a wonderful story about how we have this choice. It's not easy for any of us. But we always have this choice how we're going to respond when life seems to be throwing dirt on top of us. And we all have that in one way or another in our lives, at one time or another in our lives. And some times are worse and some times are better. But the donkey proved to us just because you throw dirt on me doesn't mean that I'm going to be buried down at the bottom of this well. And so picking up on something Amy said, that everybody's everybody's at a different you know, stage of this journey with lymphedema. And everybody's at a different stage of this journey with this thing called life, quite frankly, right? All kinds of problems. I'm sure people with lymphedema have other problems other than lymphedema, right? Having lymphedema doesn't make it any easier, but we all have all kinds of problems. And we're all taking that journey kind of like that donkey ascending from the bottom of the well, sort of an inch at a time, you know, as 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 we grow and, and learn to kind of stand on top of these problems. It makes us stronger and, it, and, it, and eventually we can find our way out. But the last thing I want to say, because I thought this was so important, what Kirsten said, this is the opposite part of, and it's, a, it's an important learning lesson that Dr. Frankel shared. Kirsten said very clearly that she was surrounded by people who loved her. She was surrounded by people who cared about her. She was surrounded by people desperately trying to pull her out of that well. But the, Dr. Frankel's teaching has two sides to the coin. It's not just when people are abusing you and mistreating you like he was being mistreated in that concentration camp that you choose to be positive and choose to be kind and choose to be forgiving. We can also behave the opposite way when we're in a bad situation and people are trying to help us. We can also choose to turn our backs on them, choose to reject them, choose to sort of wallow in our own pity. And we've all been there, too. I shouldn't speak for anybody else. I'll speak for myself. I've been there, too. And so you have real choice. You have you have a choice to be positive when things are negative, and you also have a choice to be negative when people around you are trying to be positive. And so I think that balance of those two choices is what we all go through as human beings. And I think um, I just think it's a beautiful learning lesson for for all of us. And and I think that our discussion tonight, you know, brought all of that to mind. So it's just food for thought. And I hope you know it's as meaningful to other people as it is to me because I find it really important. 
Yeah, thank you. And then that was so nice. You you pulled down the, one of the pictures from your your wall of fame there in your office, all of your your mentors and and everything. So that was wonderful. Well, there are some there are some great people, you know, and and I find you know again not to stroke her ego too much, but Amy Rivera that everybody loves so much and talks about. I mean, the fact that she wrote this book with Matt and the fact that, you know, she she's put this show together with us and someone has to be one of the leaders and be a champion of the cause. And she certainly has been. And that's why I keep some of these great people throughout history in front of me to inspire me to try to be the best that I can. But it's just it's just wonderful that we have people like her who really don't have to do what she does and goes out of her way to to raise awareness and and to help other people. It's a beautiful thing. Yes. Well, thank you, Amy. Thank you, Kirsten, um, for sharing your story. Um, So now we can switch gears and we'd like to welcome Amy Beeth from uh, Canada. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, Reading your story really... Yes, it's our pleasure. Um, reading your story, you know, this has been a lifelong thing for you. I mean, this is something that began at the age of five. Yeah. And, it did. Yeah. And it's something you you had to grow up navigating and then eventually developing it in another leg. Um, but, you know, you talk about the feeling of powerlessness and then you talk about being empowered by the end and your journey mm-hmm. has led you through so many roads and and into the holistic world as well. And we'd love to hear that journey. Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000 from Vita Support MD are backed by science and sold in doctor's offices. If you're a physician who may be interested in prescribing or selling these excellent nutraceuticals, please call 862-246-7877 to speak to a representative today. Thank you, Diane. It's been lovely hearing um, from all of you so far. And and Kirsten, her and I chat often on Instagram and can relate a lot to each other being bilateral lymphies and um, having been diagnosed uh, when we were younger. <laughs> Mine is a little bit younger than that, but <laughs> definitely had a lot of the, the growing pains that went with it as well because I was so young. It took us a while to get diagnosed. I think my mom said it was about 30 different people that we saw before somebody had a clue what it was. And we lived in a small town, um, the closest place that knew where we were was Toronto and it was an hour and a half drive away. They had a specialist hospital there and happened to have a plastic surgeon there who he was the only one that knew what lymphedema was. So I was one of his first patients and he really kind of took us on because he was at the end of his practice and he was, he wanted to do something a little bit different. Um, And so he started investigating what lymphedema was and he was very helpful, but at the same time, um, they, they didn't know much about lymphedema way back then in the eighties. Um, so my extent of care was <laughs> to come into the hospital twice a year and get measured in the OT and PT department for new stockings. And back then all you could get was beige. <laughs> there was never any of these flashy colors that exist now, <laughs> which, which are great. I'm so glad there's lots of colors now. <laughs> Um, and, and they just told me to, to move, do whatever I could to move my body. And so that began my career as a synchronized swimmer. (laughs) I used to be, I used to be in ballet and always loved kind of moving my body. And so I went to water ballet because that was easier (laughs) for my legs and kept me moving. And it was really fun. I did that for as long as I could. And then I found kind of, um, High school year is a bit hard to juggle school and and sports and stuff. So I ended up doing more um, sports at school. But any sort of movement I've found over the years to be like one of the best things for me in terms of helping me get into my body and um, help me process those difficult emotions that come with living with lymphedema. And it kept my swelling in check. So it was, it was a really good thing for me. Yes, that's wonderful. That's um, beautiful. Take your time. 
Yeah. Doing great. It made me cry. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's beautiful yeah. to see, and it's moving for me to see that after all of these years, that you still get emotional about it. Just tells us how important <laughs> this subject is. But don't, you know, don't be uh don't be shy to share and we, we appreciate your courage. Mm-hmm. I, do. I do, yeah. Um the thing that really changed for me was learning to accept my condition. I'd say I went through kind of the majority of my life until I was in my 30s doing the best I could to do do what I had to do, which was wear compression, move my body, but hit it as best I could. I didn't want people to really know about it. Um, I I tried to, I guess, minimize that it had an impact on me in a way. Like I didn't want anyone to tell me, well, you can't go and do that because you have lymphedema. Um, and so I did that as best as I could. But when I got to my 30s, I realized that there was so many pieces that I was missing and that my condition was progressing, even though I'd been told like I was a star patient um, by by my physicians and team here. And, and in Canada at the time, star patient meant you wear your compression 24 seven, you move your body um, and you take care of your skin. And that was really, we were all kind of told to do, but despite doing all those things, my condition wasn't getting any better and I was seeing it progress at a pace that was a little bit scary. Um, and I just, I didn't like how my life looked in front of me as I was getting older. Sorry. You take your time. You don't have to yeah. apologize. Don't worry about a thing. Mm-hmm. We have all the time in the world. It's yeah. funny that it still makes me so choked up because I'm in such a better place now <laughs> but obviously still have some things to work through emotionally <laughs> hey we're getting there girl we all do <laughs> we all do i have these moments too yeah. it's yeah I understand. It's, a, it's a healing journey right there's, it is. Mm-hmm. there's days that are easier than others for sure um hey, but- you know what i think it's really important because a lot of times on our show um our guests you know, they they really try to be positive and talk about all the good things that have come out of this, like I said, but I'm sure it's really important for a lot of our listeners to know that they're not the only one who's kind of still crying about it after a lot of years. That's really important information. Yeah, and let it out. Those tears are valuable and they help so much. And lymphedema is not your fault, (laughs) which so many of us carry that and think that we've done something, but really it's not. (laughs) No. It's not that. No. So here I was, kind of a star patient in my 30s. <laughs> um, but at that point, I had it bilaterally. I was wearing compression. I was monitoring my skin, doing as best I could, raising my two little girls. And every time I got a skin infection, it was getting worse. I was just compounding to the point that I would end up in the emergency department in a very short span of time, like within hours of noticing I had an infection. And I got told one day that I just might lose my legs um, if I couldn't get the infections under control. And so when I asked for, well, how are we going to do that? Nobody had any answers for me. Nobody had any suggestions of what we could do. And I finally just had a breaking point that I was just like, well, there has to be there has to be something more than this because I'm trying everything that, that, that is being offered, but humans are creative and we're curious and there's millions, billions of us on this planet. I was like, there's gotta be some other ideas out there of what to do with lymphedema. Like, like there's gotta be some other ways to try and treat it and manage it. And I was like, there must be some people out there that are doing well with it. And I've got to find them. I need some examples. And so that was that kind of segued my way into finding some people on Instagram and starting an account on there and just connecting with some other people that had lymphedema. And oh my goodness, just having that community was such a godsend to to just have people that you could laugh with, that you could ask questions, that you could learn from, and that you could just see as an example of like 
okay, like you can survive with this crazy thing. (laughs) You can live a healthy life with it. And there's different ways to do that. And you also learn that what helps you or what hurts you might be different than somebody else. And so it really kind of helps you, I guess, maybe not be so hard on yourself that you haven't figured out how to stop it, that you start to develop some self-compassion um, as well through that curiosity and extending out to others because you learn how to be a shoulder for them mm-hmm. on a day when they don't want a lymphy. <laughs> and then they, they return the favor and reach out to you or um, just know what it's like to go through. And, and that is huge. So that was where I learned about um, lymphedema surgeries. And I was very kind of curious about that. And so that helped um, help me just kind of think, well, maybe there is something out there that could help, especially when it looks like it has a good track record for stopping infection recurrence. And I thought, if it does that, sign me up. <laughs> I'll do whatever it takes. And so after kind of interviewing a bunch of different um, patients who've gone through surgeries with different different surgeons and things like that. I used to be a research librarian in, in healthcare facilities and hospitals and stuff. So I loved kind of researching that stuff. And um, and so I thought, well, I'm just going to research this and see what I can find out, see if it's legit. Because when I ask any of the doctors or my healthcare staff here, they're like, never heard of it. Don't know what it is. But you're not even supposed to get a scratch on your leg. So I don't think you should get surgery. <laughs> And that was the best answer I could get here. So um, I ended up having surgery overseas with Dr. Corinne Becker, who is out of France. And I had gone to see her for a lymphatic MRI in a meeting initially to kind of see like, am I a candidate or not? And I was. Um, So I ended up going back for for a lymph node transfer surgery and a sapple surgery with her. She did them both together on one leg. And so at this point, my left leg that she operated on had had the surgery for, or sorry, had had lymphedema for about 30, 33 years. So a lot of fibrosis and um, that had built up. But just to have that one surgery done, improve my quality of life dramatically because it what was interesting is after having the surgeries like all those self-care things that we do for ourselves in terms of skincare and compression and massage and um, lymph drainage what exercises we do we might have some tools that we use that helps bring down the smelling Um, they work so much better after the surgery what was interesting because that tough fibrotic tissue a bit of that was gone and it just helped a lot and thankfully i haven't had any infections since in that leg and it's eight plus years now not something i could have ever imagined yeah that's wonderful you you talk about you know the toolbox so it's yeah. you know, the toolbox of your of your methods but of your experiences as well and mm-hmm. and i and i found a parallel with kirsten because kirsten carries around a toolbox of sorts <laughs> we discussed like your carry on case because oh if you forgot something it's not like lymphedema people could go buy these things in a in a supermarket right and if you're traveling yeah. or if you're you know even just going to work so you carry all those these items and, you know, that yeah. you might need. And and it's just, it's so funny how the two of you, you know, have that, but, you know, just slightly different, uh, like concept. Yeah. But, I love calling it a toolbox or I stuff yeah. things like I, I carry around like a school backpack <laughs> with mm-hmm. me instead of like a purse because it's got different lymphedema tools in it that I might need throughout my day. And at first, like the to to give you an idea of the mindset because I know we got talking about that and I think that's so important. Like for me, in some ways, I didn't I didn't love having those tools. Like I knew they helped me, but I didn't really love that I had to use them in order to get to be the person that I wanted to be. Like I, in some ways, kind of resented them. I'm just like, yeah, like I have to use this thing, and it was the I have to instead of I get to. I get to use this thing so that 
I can show up as a better person for myself. Mm -hmm. And like, who wouldn't want that? <laughs> like seeing that impact on my family when I would do those things for myself, allowing me to be a better mom, a better partner mm -hmm. and was, was so helpful because then I didn't resent that time that I was taking for myself and that self-care, I saw it as I'm filling my cup up so I get to do all these other fun things with them. And that helps so much that, that mindset piece, there's such a big part to lymphedema that we often miss that psychosocial emotional side to it. It really is a, a whole body experience. Right. And I know that, you know, you, you talk a lot about the, the Ayurveda uh, approach to this and which yeah. is, is the holistic whole body, mind, spirit type of thing. Yeah. And the more I'm reading about this, the more I'm, I'm hearing this as well with chronic disease. This is really, it seems to be an absolutely great approach <laughs> to this because when you, when you look at Ayurvedic versus like biomedical, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of like the whole, you know, all of the integration of the parts, whereas with biomedical, you start with the, the molecular, the cells and like the smaller components, which then go into the larger systems, which then, and it's two completely way of different ways of thinking of this. And when you think of something like lymphedema, I mean, mm -hmm. you, you can't just say, well, this is all about my leg. You know, it's because it's it's not. I mean, there's so many, no. and all of the self care that you talk about mm -hmm. addresses that that physical and physiologic is issue. But then there's tell us a little bit more about that holistic process. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I got into studying Ayurveda, and I remember going to um, just a class at, at a yoga studio that I was visiting, and they said, well, come, there's like this introduction to Ayurveda class like next weekend. I was like, okay. And so I went and, and listened to it, and I nearly fell off my chair when they said like that Ayurveda studies the lymph and considers the lymph like the most important tissue that you you treat it first before you treat anything else because it's water. It's our bio water. You need water for every single process in the body. And so of course you start there because if the health of the water isn't, isn't good, everything is affected. And it was just like, Oh, this is so interesting. They look at it in such a different, different way. And so it was nice to have as a, a as a compliment to it. I, I, I still um, think it's really important to do the compression and, and all the other things. But what I love for Ayurveda and the self-care is, is learning how to nurture your lymphatic system, learning how to strengthen it, as well as take the load off of it. Because there's so many roles that our lymph system plays when we look at the holistic approaches the self-care that we can provide to it it helps take the burden from it so that it can do the things that it needs to do from when it's impaired in us in a slightly better way so like for example it could compression is stretchy it can only hold like so much and if you're eating the wrong foods you're not moving you're not attending to your skincare, you're thinking awful thoughts that are making you really stressed or inflamed, then you're asking your compression to do a lot for you to try and contain that swelling versus, you know, going to bed before 10, making sure to eat an anti-inflammatory diet, do some dry brushing to just help support the body so that the compression can do its job, but maybe it can do an even better job. Because you've lightened the load a bit. You also talked about the importance of of journaling because everybody mm -hmm. and, and Amy, you, you know, Kirsten, everybody's had their their way of learning about themselves and what works the best. And you talked about journaling and, and this concept of throwing the spaghetti at the wall, see what sticks. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and this, these are the kind of things you, you know you teach. So right, yeah. so you 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 have um, I guess did you do like online classes or 
Yeah, I do online classes um, that people can take with me as like a private consult. And there's a little seven day self-care journaling that people can download and kind of go through to help you kind of identify some of those patterns within yourself as to, you know, what are what are your food triggers? Maybe you're not sure like which ones are making you more swollen, which ones are better for you. Um, Or when your, when your mood is up and moving, your mood is down, like tying that to kind of activities that you're doing at that time or foods you're eating at that time can kind of help you see some patterns within yourself of where you can tweak things to make them more aligned for you. Um, And just like there are so many different self-care opportunities or exercises. For example, like I don't say everybody should do yoga. You know, I love yoga. (laughs) I just say it's really best to be consistent. So find something that you like doing. If you love walking and hiking, then go for it. Like just do that. If you love being in the pool, find some deep water aquafit or a lane, like a pool close to you that you can lane swim or things like that the idea is just to be consistent and help move that lymph and versus like um that it has to be something specific but there are some specific things that help us (laughs) too so yeah it's it's figuring it out that spaghetti on the wall i guess (laughs) right right um, Amy, you know, this, this holistic process that, you know, and, and I love that you brought up the Ayurvedic because that's, I mean, it's, it's just such a great way of looking at this because you did, yeah. there, there is that there's like John mentioned the, the psycho social aspect of everything too. There's so much to consider and so much to manage. Yeah. Um, Amy, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I've worked closely with Amy before and <laughs> I agree with what she's saying, but you know, she, she said something that the, like the light bulb went off on my head. <laughs> it was about making our compression work harder than it needs to work. And I never really thought of that. And, but it's so true. And so mm-hmm. I'm going to remember that the next time that I, cause even though, you know, social media makes things look like we love doing everything we do, but Amy's right. There are times where we just don't want to do the things that we we should yeah. be doing. So next time I'm gonna think about my compression when I'm like, ah, I really yeah. don't want to get up to dry brush. But as soon as you do it, like an affirmation to say like future Amy's gonna really appreciate this can sometimes help motivate you to do it anyway. <laughs> right. Right. So I I, you know, just recently I reached out to Amy about um castor oil packs. Like there's just so much that so much knowledge that she has and she's right that our our bodies are so connected. And I do agree that our lymph is probably the most important because it, I always say it's like the oil that runs the car, our engines, our heart. So, um, I've been fascinated with this area of research and I've been going down a rabbit hole myself and the more things that I do try, the better I feel. So Mm-hmm. hats it's off to you Amy, for taking this and turning it into a passion of yours because when you talk with Amy or you meet with Amy you can see that she is very passionate about <laughs> her lifestyle and she lives her lifestyle so yeah I totally agree thanks yeah. Amy springtime is a fun time for Arabita too because it's the change of seasons for us it's um we're moving into what's called kappa and the elements of that are, are earth and water. And so what you see around you outside is like mud, <laughs> rain, um, as well as like the earth starting to wake up. We're getting slightly longer days. And how that is with the swelling, how they describe it in Ayurveda, how they describe lymphedema is it is a kappa imbalance. It is that heaviness, that stagnation, that heavy water energy we have. So sometimes when you have lymphedema, spring can be the hardest time because it's that spring, it's that same energy in the environment around you. Can I say something? Yeah. I'm going to flare up right now. As soon as this is changed, I promise you, I am so swollen from the waist down. Both legs, abdominal area. That's why I reached out to you about it. So it's mm-hmm. funny you say that because I was doing really well and then the season changed and I'm in a full flare up right now. 
Yeah. And we might find seasons like fall where all of a sudden it cools off and it dries to be like our best. And seasons like summer where it's hot and it's fiery that re- increases inflammation. So it can be can be harder than that. And you'll need different tools like throughout the year. So seeing it from that seasonal perspective can help you get out of your mind that it's your fault or it's something you're doing or not doing. You can kind of look at it from a seasonal perspective of like, well, what can I do in this season that will help me? Or like, oh yeah, I am feeling heavy. I understand (laughs) it's like that outside. And in Ayurveda, it's opposite spring balance. So think of, well, how can I, how can I lighten things up? If it's heavy this time of year, what can I do to lighten things up? Um, energetically or in my foods or in my movements in my thoughts as well yeah that's great what do you say dr chubak <laughs> i say it's beautiful it's amazing stuff i think it's great conversation and this is why we have the conversations we we bring we bring people together and uh, share ideas and share thoughts and mastermind and you know we build the third mind together where we think of things that we couldn't have thought of any of us on our own. And, um, Mm -hmm. you know, I never ever have one of these programs where I haven't learned something or um, thought deeply about something. You know, some of the things that that were mentioned that I think bear kind of highlighting and repeating a little bit is, you know, the idea of the skin infections um, that Amy was getting, what we call cellulitis. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I I was recently a guest... um, of Eric Ansard on the LymphCast podcast and talking about the circulatory system as a cardiac surgeon and a cardiovascular surgeon, how how the heart is related to the circulatory system, the lymphatic system, and so forth. And we went through that. We talked about, as Amy said, the heart is the engine, it's the it's the pump. Um, but then you have the blood, you have the the arterial blood vessels and the venous blood vessels and then the lymphatic vessels. So that's part of the circulatory system. But what makes the lymphatic system so um, extraordinary is that it's also part of the immunological system. It's part of the immune system and associated with the lymph nodes and so forth. And all of that is then tied into the dermatological system. So all of these systems that are magnificently complex and magnificently wonderful bodies are interrelated in such a intricate and delicate way. And the balance is so subtle that um, we have to appreciate each one of these systems and do everything we can. And that's another thing that I bring up on, on the program is that other than being a physical problem, a, path, a pathophysical problem, an anatomical problem, and a psychosocial and an emotional problem, um, be, because of that complexity, as compared to, let's say, a broken bone or, or an inflamed appendix, we also need to reach out to numerous helpers inside and outside of traditional medicine. And that's why I think this discussion of Ayurvedic is so important, the the discussion of yoga, the discussion of meditation, positive psychology. So I've said on the show many times, Mm -hmm. writing a list before me again, you know, I think that for the, and this isn't for everybody, none of these are for everybody, but you, for our listeners, you might want to pick and choose from, from this menu and access as many people you can. There can be a therapist, meaning a, a psychotherapist, a surgeon, a dietitian, a nutritionist, an Ayurvedic specialist, a physical trainer, exercise trainer, a medical doctor in terms of a primary care internist. You may need um, an infectious disease specialist sometime. You might need a um, dermatologist. You may need a uh, physical therapist specializing in lymph- specializing in lymphatic therapy, hands-on therapy, manual lymphatic drainage, dry brushing, um, dietary supplementation, uh, journaling, um, group group therapy, leaning on each other, joining support groups. Um, I mean, it, it's hard for me as a physician and a surgeon with the training that I've had to think of too many other diseases that would require such a 
comprehensive group of specialists and experts to help with all of the components of that of that disease. I mean, this is a disease that I've said many times on the program has been um, greatly uh, ignored, neglected, misunderstood, under educated on in terms of teaching people in healthcare specialties about the lymphatic system and lymphatic diseases. Um, and so no wonder, generally speaking, around the country and around the world, people are getting suboptimal results in their care. L late diagnosis, delay to diagnosis, because there's such ignorance within the medical field even today. And that's another great inspiration for our show to raise awareness. So this is a very, very complicated problem. I think the more voices that we bring, the more discussions that we have, the more conversations that we have, the more we raise awareness, the, the better we're all going to be as patients, as caregivers. Um, but I know in my heart that after a program like tonight's program, we're going to touch a lot of lives. I mean, the stories that were, were told here by Kirsten and Amy, and of course, Amy Rivera's story that we we talk about you know again and again and from time to time somebody out there said oh that sounds like me oh that's how i feel oh that's what happened to me oh that's what happened to my sister or that's what happened to my brother and i have to call him and the last thing i'll say is that it's incredible how little things can help with lymphedema mm -hmm. i saw a patient today she's she was referred to me i, I saw her for the first time she's an attorney she's probably I don't know, in her 30s, maybe maybe 40s, early 40s, um, very fit, very um, uh, a person who takes excellent care of herself. Well, she has lymphedema in the left leg that occurred after a sprained ankle, and it's never gone away. At Vita Support MD, we believe in creating the best bioflavonoid-based supplements to support your vitality. Bioflavonoids are found in abundance in nature and support excellent health and wellness. The demands and stresses being put on our bodies in these challenging times are unlike any we have seen before. Support your body with the flavonoids it needs to fight inflammation and oxidation. Unlike other products in the marketplace, Vita Support MD dietary supplements use micronized flavonoids for optimal absorption and effectiveness. Micronization is an advanced process which creates an ultra-fine powder easily absorbed by the body. At Vita Support MD, we are passionate about making your good health our life's work. And she's seen dozens of doctors. And today I asked her about her surgical history and so forth. And I said, did you ever have any pelvic surgery? Did you ever have any um, malignancy, any cancer, any radiation, any this? And no, 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 no. Everybody asks me this. I, mean, I said, did you ever have a hernia repair? She said, no. And then she said, actually, I had a bilateral hernia repair as an infant. Yes, I do. I do. I have two scars mm -hmm. in my arms. And I said, well, you know, I can't be certain that that's associated, but there's a possibility that the reason that you developed lymphedema after sort of a simple sprained ankle, whereas most of us wouldn't, is you may have had mm -hmm. some degree of lymphatic injury in the groin, which is a very critical drainage area as an infant. And so you may have kind of had a borderline hypo, you know, hypofunctioning lymphatic system in that limb your whole leg. And then with the injury, that might have been just enough to tip it over. Now, the reality is that's probably not going to mean all that much in terms of her care or her outcome. But I can't tell you how happy she was to have what seemed to be a plausible answer for why this happened to her. And we see that again and again, that everybody is thrilled when they get the diagnosis, because it's like, I've been searching for years to find out what's wrong with me. So the doctor says right to Amy, well, this is what's wrong with you. We don't know much about what to do about it, but you know, come twice a year and we'll measure your leg and wear your stockings and your start. But, but, but even that little bit of 
of knowledge. And again, going back to a subject we talk about all the time, the idea that it's not your fault. I haven't done anything wrong. I haven't caused this by being a bad person, by being a bad mother, by being a bad sister, by not exercising, by eating the wrong things. Just having a proper diagnosis is helpful. And that's why we're talking to doctors on the show. Please look at your patients, examine your patients, think about this diagnosis. And for those of you who are out there listening and thinking, maybe this is what I have, go see a specialist. And if you're not satisfied, I say it again and again, with the first or the second opinion, go for the third and the fourth and the fifth, because knowledge is power. And sometimes just knowing what you have can help you feel better, can start that healing healing process. So again, I've had a I've had a remarkable experience. Amy really touched me. Kirsten really touched me. And um, I'm so happy we're doing this. And I, I hope we, we do it for the foreseeable future because I know we're touching a lot of lives. We get we get tremendous feedback. And that makes me, you know, makes my hat my heart very happy to know that. Yes. Yes, no, for sure. Knowledge opens a lot of doors. And it seems as though, you know, all of you ladies have experienced that. And you've all, you know, you've all become leaders and mentors and teachers now. And um, you didn't you didn't ask to be put into this situation, but it's been obviously very transformative for all of you. So I thank you for all that you're doing for everyone else out there who, you know, is really looking for answers. So Thank you for that. And, you know, um, Amy B, you are, you are, you're an emotional person, but I think that you're just the right type of person, the type of empathy and, you know, you to be the, the, the teacher that you are. So, you know, again, I, it's, it's, you've, you've, I, you've all found your calling, you know, in one way or another with this. So, um, uh, yeah, so kind of found you. us, right. <laughs> <laughs> it did. It did indeed. John, what what is the um sort of that that quote that you, you told <laughs> Amy that one time about um you know your the life's purpose found her or something? Mm-hmm. Do you know what I'm talking yeah. about, Amy? Yeah, oh, I, I mean, you. yeah, vaguely. I mean, there, there's a quote that says, you know, basically, um, I think. Uh, it could be Adler who said that, but basically I'm I'm glad that my, you know, I'm I'm grateful to my my problem more life for more or less. I'm grateful to to my problem for showing me what my life's purpose was. And, mm-hmm. and there's there's a lot of truth in that. A lot of truth in that. Yeah. And I have to say real quick, Dr. Chubak, the person you saw today emailed me last week telling me how excited she was to meet you today. Aww. So when you started talking, I'm like, I know. Well, she hadn't met me yet, Amy. So you gotta, you have to follow up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> should I be careful? Like, so no, no. no. That's exciting. In, in fact, I got a, I got a text message from my niece, who's also an attorney here in New Jersey, and she she didn't know that we were related until our until our consult, and she she appears to have been very very happy with the experience because as i said she's just so there's not that much more that i'm going to be able to do for her at this time but she just felt so empowered by knowing that hey maybe this this hernia repair that i had as an infant is the reason that this happened to me because otherwise it's human nature we rack our brains why did this happen to me why did this happen mm-hmm. to me and when you get some plausible answer then it it can at least put that part of your your mind to rest to say it's not something that I've done and it's inc- it's it's just extraordinary how often I see that with patients that we as human beings I don't know if it's our culture or it's just genetic but we our first our first inclination is to blame ourselves that somehow we're responsible for our lipedema. We're responsible for our lymphedema. We're responsible for our venous insufficiency in our varicose veins. You know, patients come to me and they want to blame themselves for their varicose veins. I stood too long. I should have never become a nurse. I should have never become a hairdresser. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's not your fault. It's okay. It's not your fault. But, Thank you for um, saying that. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Yes, Absolutely. Well, everyone, I think we've had an absolutely tremendous show and I thank you all for bringing your stories to us and, you know, and I thank all of our listeners for, for being there to, to 
capture all of this because, you know, it's it's only going to help, I believe, when I think about, you know, I use the term lymphies because you guys use that all the time. And, and, and this generation, right, because the previous generation maybe didn't have social media, maybe didn't have all the digital ways to communicate and across the world, you know, and now I feel this generation, you are all the mentors and you're the teachers and you're the ones that have gone through the experience, but only then now you have this voice, which is just, and we can amplify this message. We here at LymphCast amplify this. And I just feel as though the children now coming up on this are going to know so much more um, and just address this in a completely different way, you know, in medicine as well. So again, I thank you. I think this has been a wonderful show. I and wanna, again, Diane, I want to, I want to yes. add one thing. We, you know, Catherine Sale, who's on the show recently, um, she's been a great champion of this idea that it's not your fault. And I think that we're all, on board with that idea that it's not your fault when it's lymphedema, lipedema, et cetera. Um, but the other part of it is, that's great to know that it's not your fault. But what's even greater now, and, and you made me think of this, Diane, with your remarks, we live in a golden age. We live in a golden age of, of interconnection between people. Think about the generation before that Diane's referring to. They, there was no way for them to ever access this information, to ever <laughs> access this knowledge, to ever know that there was another human being on the entire earth who felt or looked or, or behaved or went through what they were going through. And now there are so many platforms where people with lymphatic problems, people with lipedema, et cetera, are connecting and leaning on one, one another. And we live in a golden age in terms of technology. We live in a golden age in terms of research. And one of the things, now I'm a little bit biased perhaps, but as a surgeon, I really believe, and I'm going to make it my business, to see that surgery for these problems gets more and more attention, more and more research, and the results only improve. When I had Dr. Hocken Borson on this program a few months ago, the guy absolutely blew my mind, and I'm in touch with him all the time now. I had no idea, and I'm a highly trained surgeon, trained in some of the best places in the country and in the world. I had no idea that one could do lymphedema, uh, liposuction for lymphedema. It, it, the way I was trained, that would be heresy. You would think you would only make matters worse. And people like yeah. Dr. Borson are having incredible results. So there's lymph node transfer that was talked about on this show. There's SAPL that was talked about on this show. There's uh, uh, lymphovenous anastomosis that was talked on this sh talked about on the show. And of course, liposuction for lymphedema. These things are in their infancy in the United States and around the world for that matter. And I think that there's going to be an explosion as we shed light on this on this problem together and increase access to training for young surgeons and surgeons who have an interest. And I think it's going to have a massive, massive impact on the quality of life for, for millions of patients with lymphedema who are not getting any surgical care at all in most cases now. So I just wanted to throw that in. And the last thing that I always say, not only is it not your fault, but there, fault, but there's always hope and there's always help. There's hope and there's help and keep Mm -hmm. Whoever's listening, don't lose hope and keep looking for help because we are we are um, sort of sounding the bell and we're waking everybody up and more and more physicians around this country and other healthcare allies are are going to be knowledgeable and aware and help is on its way. Absolutely, amen to that. Can well, I ask I, something before we go? Of Alex. course. Um, the couple of the last things that have been just mentioned and, you know, having a diagnosis is better than not having anyone, any diagnosis at all. So like your patient today, um, John, you know, she was just so excited to, to have something. And I remember that feeling 10 years ago. Um, that was a good feeling. And you go from that to accepting, going back to that word acceptance and finding your acceptance. And now I'm at the point 10 years later where I'm like, you know, I'm thankful I have it, you know, maybe on the bad days, it's a little harder to say that, but I know each and every one of you and each and one of you are, play a role in my life. And, and each and one of you are very special to that for me. I mean, Amy B, you are the very first people I ever found um, oh. on my personal Instagram account before I even started the lymphedema account. And then 
Amy R. Ninjas Fighting Lymphedema is one of the very first organizations that I found. And that's kind of what led me to like, you know, knowledge is power and to build my own knowledge about it. And so now where I'm at today mentally is, you know what, there are people in my lives that wouldn't have been in my life before lymphedema. And I'm thankful that for that. I'm thankful for my surgeon, Dr. Alu. I'm thankful for my occupational th- therapist, Valerie. Like I'm thankful for all those people. And so now I'm at the point where I've done the Instagram thing and we've written this book, this anthology, and I, I want to find my purpose for lymphedema. Um, Amy R- Rivera has uh, inspired me to write my own book. So um, I'm currently at 17,000 words and working on it, but um, I've been inspired to write my own book. And oh my I gosh, wanna... that's amazing, Kirsten. <laughs> Thank you. Incredible. And I want to do something to help raise money for people who really can't afford stuff because I know and understand how much a financial burden it is. And I'm very thankful to my husband and I are in a position where we budget for it, but we can make it work. But unfortunately, there are people out there who just can't. And then thinking of Violence Feet Foundation and, you know, the what they're doing with Camp Watch Me and Betty being a part of that is amazing. Mm-hmm. Do you imagine if something was like that when we were younger? Like if we'd gotten to go to something like that as teenagers, that would have just been mind blowing. I mean, I didn't have pediatric lymphedema, so I couldn't even fathom what it's like being a kid. Um, But even to go as a teenager, wouldn't that have been so neat? I mean, even as a college kid, things were being said behind my back and they weren't part of my life. That's fine. That's how you find out who your real friends are. And it doesn't bother me at all. Like, that's fine. And Amy V, at one point you said, you know, you and your kids, like your family, you go off and you go do something. And now it's so much fun. And, it's so much fun. And it is. And well, first of all, it's like, and I can relate to that. And, and it's sad. It's like, it shouldn't have to be that way. Um, but with this disease, unfortunately, it, it can be, but you just got to get past that point. And after, so I've had the ways you method on doing the fun stuff. If you yeah. just accept it and embrace it and think, these are things that help me show up so that I can go have fun with them. Like, why wouldn't I want that? Like if, if yeah. I was my best friend, I would want to make sure my best friend brought the yeah. things so that they could still come and, and have fun. Like, instead of thinking, well, like, okay, I have to travel somewhere. My suitcase is half full with limpy stuff. Yeah. <laughs> the and- other half is for everything else. And I'm in a year and a half of my recovery process for my lymph node transfer and liposuction on my left leg. I've, I've had everything on both legs now, apart from lymph node transfer on my le- right leg. But otherwise, I've had everything. Me too. On my you and I share that. And when I was six months into this last surgery a year and a half ago, and I was far enough along, I was wearing compression again, I was starting to be active again. When I saw Dr. Lou for my six-month checkup, my first words, life is so much fun. I never knew life was fun. And mm-hmm. a year prior to that summer, so starting summer 2022, I could no longer walk up the stairs because my left leg had just overnight, just drastically went downhill. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't even using a staircase at work anymore. And so that's when we we did the Ellen LNT. And my first words to him were life is so much fun. Not, wow. not to say, you know, maybe surgery is not for everybody, you know, obviously consult your doctors and, you know, people reach out to me a lot about it. I'm like, look, I'm not a medical professional, but you got to do, you got to decide what's best for you based on the knowledge that you and your doctor have. Um, and, uh, what risk are you willing to take? Um, cause I know, unfortunately it hasn't worked as successfully for, for everybody. And I hate that for them. Um, but I really related to what you said, Amy, is is life is fun. And and that's mm-hmm. where that switch has really yeah. happened the last two years. And it's just, you know, you go from that hole, you go from that well. Yeah. And I don't want everyone to be there. I want I mm-hmm. want it's a it's a mental well too, right? Like your well um symbolism like brought up so much for me, like before my surgeries and I was struggling with chronic infections and stuff all the time it's hard not to let lymphedema be in every part of your day just because it's painful it's it's ever present it's achy what you're trying isn't working and you're not necessarily knowing what you should do differently so you're constantly questioning more than should I do this should I not like is this going to make it worse is this going to make it better it wakes me up all the night most nights like it drives me crazy (laughs) it is constant 
And as I got to the other side of recovery since my three surgeries is lymphedema no longer takes up that headspace of all the time for me because it's not hurting and I feel more mobile. My quality of life has improved so much that I can go, you know, a while without having to second guess, like, will this make it worse? Will this make it better? Because I know that there's tools and stuff I can use throughout the day or at nighttime that will bring it back down. And I don't panic as much as when I get a bit of swelling, because before I get a bit of swelling and I couldn't get it back down because it was so thick. Because it's a lot softer, sometimes you get a bit of swelling because it's auto tied. And you know that those tools will help bring it back down. So it's, it's a lot less stressful now. It is. It's stressful and it's fun. It's a lot more fun. <laughs> love that. That too. I love that. I love that. And I'd love to end on that note because that is, that is the perfect upswing that we should leave on. And that, and that's something, you know, any listener right now could look forward to. So thank you very much mm-hmm. for that little end discussion. Um, well, I want to thank you all again. I want to thank Amy and Matt for bringing us this book. And through this mm-hmm. book, you've brought us these wonderful guests. Oh, see, everybody's got one. <laughs> and right, Amy, everybody can get one on Amazon. And, um, you know, it's just this idea that you're not alone, that the the tribe is powerful, right? And we just stick together, communicate and teach each other, mentor each other. And um, we're, we'll bring this to another, a new age, for sure. Do you think, Dr. Chubak? I have no question about it. We're on our way. It's a, it's a journey. It's, it's a one step at a time, but every program helps. Every discussion helps. Every new book helps. Every new story helps. We are, there's no doubt in my mind that we're going to beat this thing. Um, it's going to take time, and every patient's different, but there are so many avenues to explore and again, I have a bias, but I think surgery is being grossly underutilized. And I think it's going to be a, a big, big push in the next 10 years in this country. Yeah. Wonderful. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Paul, you could take us out. You know, I'm listening to the show tonight and we have two Dr. Chewbacks with Diane and John. So I'm addressing the two of you. If you continue to put shows together that are this impressive, this powerful and this emotional, you might want to consider approaching the Kleenex Corporation to sponsor the show. <laughs> Th- they'll sell millions of boxes just in one hour. What a show. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an emotional wreck after this. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. uh, no. great. My heart my heart is full, for yeah. sure. Great job to all. You've been watching and listening to LymphCast, episode 48. Remember to visit our website a bunch of times, early and often, and watch and listen to each show several times. You'll hear information you didn't hear the first time. At least that's how it works for me. Our website, again, lymphcastnetwork.com. We're on YouTube. We're on every podcast platform out there. You can find us easily. And let's go around the room and thank our panel tonight. Uh, before I uh, thank the two hosts, uh, uh, Dr. Diane Schubeck, would you take a moment and thank our three guests tonight? Absolutely. Amy Rivera, once again, thank you for putting this book together and bringing everyone here. And um, and Amy Beat, I thank you very much for your story. You got us all crying here, but, you know, <laughs> it's it's all wonderful and, you know, so much to learn from you. Thank you so much. Thank you for hearing and, me. And Kirsten, Kirsten Wall, thank you very much for your story and all of your insights and input into this Uh, You have a beautiful energy and I just love it. And I wish you so much luck on your book and maybe you'll come back on the show when we've got this book out and we'd love to hear that all about that as well. Thank you so much. All right. That sounds very good. Let's thank the gentleman who came up with this concept to sell millions of boxes of Kleenex with the show LymphCast. (laughs) (laughs) Physician surgeon from New Jersey. He's also the owner and founder of Vita Support MD. They make vein formula 1000 and lymphatic formula 1000 dr john a chuback thank you for everything sir thank you paul and i want to make it clear I, as far as i know i don't own any stock in kleenex corporation <laughs> so there's no there's no uh, hidden agenda but thank you all for being here tonight it was a lovely lovely discussion i learned a lot i hope that um someone learned something from what i said and i know that with our guests uh stories and advice and 
uh, words, I know for a fact we've touched thousands of lives once again. So thank you all. Absolutely. And the CEO of the Chewback Medical Group, she is also the producer of this show. So she's equally as responsible for all the Kleenex flying around tonight. Dr. Diane Chewback, thank you for everything. Thank you very much. This was a great show. I look forward to many more. Absolutely. Again, LymphCast. This has been episode 48. Our website again, lymphcastnetwork.com. Have a great evening. We'll see you next time for LymphCast episode 49.